Good day. And uh, hello, I pray and hope that you've had a good day today. And thank you for inviting me into your homes or your places or wherever you're watching this or listening to this. And um, here we are where we live here in central Alberta, um, Canada, where we are close to our annual Remembrance Day when we spend um, moments of that day considering all those who have uh, gone to war over the years and, and during our nation and nation's history and we just take that time to remember that. It's called Remembrance Day and because uh, I'm just suspecting that maybe somebody is in another country not necessarily doing that. Enough said. Um, please uh, uh, join me today as we continue in the sermon series that we started a number of weeks back, uh, Psalm 119, The Path to Life. The email arrived first thing in the morning with the clear-cut instructions as follows. Depart immediately, go and deliver the attached instruction word for word. Do not change one word, one comma, not a thing, post haste. Well, with one stroke of the key, he deleted the email. He grabbed his bag already packed with the uh, basic necessities. Anything else uh, he could pick up whenever reaching his destination, wherever that might be. And with ferry tickets in hand, he secured his apartment at the final time. He had no intentions of returning. He was determined that he wasn't going to deliver the message anywhere, anytime, to anybody. They could get somebody else. His intention was to go the other direction as far and as fast as possible. Later in the day, as the ferry made its way across the street, he noticed the sky was darker and the waves becoming bigger and bigger as they bashed against the hull of the ship. And then the heavy rain came, wave after wave falling from the darkened clouds. And in what seemed but just a brief moment of time, the ferry lurched from side to side, swaying more violently with every crash of the waves, and then it began taking on water. Alarms rang out. Commands were given. People lining up with life jackets before their assigned lifeboats. And soon, too soon, the lifeboats were in the raging waters of the sea. Waves growing and heaving, tossing the lifeboats to and fro, here and there. And then he heard it. The cries of the people over the sound of the storm. The internal fear turning outward for all to hear. Then the fear turning to anger. And cries coming out. Why is this happening? Are we going to die? Why, oh why? But he knew why. He understood all too well why. Why they were being tossed to and fro by the seas and the waves. It was his fault. He was the one that brought it all upon them. And when he deleted the email and ran the other direction, he knew, he knew it would not turn out good at all. And yet, he kept it to himself. He didn't warn anybody. He closed his ears to the cries. He was a reason for all this. And in the midst of the growing fears and cries for help, he prayed, have mercy on me, God. Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 119 as we continue to spend time in studying this, the longest psalm in the Psalter, starting at verse 41. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and I shall not be put to shame, for I find delight, I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I, lift, I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Please join me in prayer. 
Our Lord and God, we thank you for this time as we turn to your word. And as we've been walking through these verses, uh, the first um, 40 of them, Lord, we've seen um, the word of God speak to us in so many different ways by your spirit, and we thank you so much. And we just want to take this time to commit this to you and that it would move us closer to you and not only closer to you, but in action in our own lives, wherever we live. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin to unpack the text, it would be helpful to be reminded what we had said at the very beginning in that initial message regarding some of the uh, features of this psalm. What we have here in Psalm 119, as in with all the psalms, quite frankly, is Hebrew poetry. And specifically, Psalm 119 is uh, what we called Hebrew alphabetic acrostic poetry on that very first day as we looked at some of the features. So each line of our text for today, from verse 41 through to 48, in the original Hebrew, Hebrew, not Hebrew, Hebrew, would have begun with the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it sounds like this, Vav, Vav. Don't worry about it. You're probably, if, you're, if you know Hebrew, you probably know I messed it up. But here's what's interesting to note. There are almost no words in Hebrew that begin with this letter. For the letter of Vav is properly a conjunction. So this means that in our text, each verse in the original begins with a conjunction. For example, the ESV, which I just read from, has included words that act like conjunctions in their translation. For example, in verse 42, we have the word then. And in verse 43, 45, 46, and 48, we have the, ver the word and. Now this brings me to the point of, of this, thankfully, brief grammar lesson. When we encounter a conjunction, we bring forward with us all that the writer or speaker had written or discussed previously as they continue to write and speak or speak now. We do this in our own English language. We do it in many other languages. We do it here with the ancient Hebrew. So in essence, the psalmist, by using the Vav conjunction, connects all that he had prayed beginning at verse 1 and brings this with him into here, into verse 41 and following. So then we can say, in view of the first 40 verses, the psalmist now said, or prayed, let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Verse 41. So what had the psalmist prayed and brought in to this particular verse 41? Well, we can't cover everything here, but some of the things that we can know is the psalmist had prayed that God would give him understanding, illumination, if you will, of the word of God so that his path in life would bear a testimony to the faithfulness of God. That would be verse 27 and verse 30. The psalmist had prayed that God would teach him, verse 33, would lead him, verse 35, in the path of life. A life that was committed to obedience with all his strength, his mind, and love. Verse 34. The psalmist had prayed that God, through the means of the word of God, would keep him from worthless things. Verse 37. And that God would revive him, give him life as he faced his own trials and tribulations and even persecutions. He had prayed that God would fulfill his promise and for a growing reverence of God or a growing fear of God, verse 38. And he prayed that God would turn away the reproach, that is, the blame and condemnation coming to him for his faith in God from others, verse 39. For his delight, the psalmist's delight and desire was placed in the righteousness of God, verse 40. And now, here at verse 41, the psalmist's uh, uh, prayer takes on a new dimension, if you will. He, his prayer has become a plea to God. Uh, he is pleading to God, let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Verse 41. Let's camp here a little bit, well, for a while actually. And please notice with me the phrase steadfast love. 
Steadfast love, translated here by the ESV. The Hebrew plural noun is transliterated from Hebrew as hesed. H-E-S-E-D is one way we can put it. Hesed, or print it, or write it. Hesed. And the meaning of the word hesed can lose its broader meaning, or its better meaning, or greater meaning, however you want to put it, in our English translations. For example, the ESV translates it as we, you heard me read it, steadfast love. The NIV, unfailing love. Now these are good translations of hesed. But when we look at, say, the New King James Version, it has done, I think, a good job of capturing the fullness of the meaning of this Hebrew noun, plural noun. And the New King James Version puts it this way. Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord. The word mercies, this is mercy, or mercies, the plural mercies. The psalmist had made his plea and recognized, as one commentator put it, quote, mercy and salvation come from God to man through the word of God. Now, a celebrity uh, preacher Close to 20 years ago, uh, authored a book called Your Best Life Now, Seven Steps to Living at Your Full Potential. This book would soon become a bestseller. Within two years, it sold uh, about 8 million copies. And capitalizing on the popularity of the book and its author, you know, many calendars were made, board games were made, and even uh, study guides came next. But here's the point. The Word of God does more than simply point one toward mercy and salvation. Because it's not a self-help book like your best life now. The Apostle Paul put it this way in his letter to his dear friend Timothy and co-laborer in the Gospel. Paul said, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is, in other words, inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16. Well, let's go back to Psalm 119. Because in that psalm, further along past where we are today, the psalmist said, Let your mercy come to me, that I may live, for your law is my delight. Verse 77. My friends, indeed, the word of God is not some self-help book. What it is, is in one way, the will of God revealed to you and me in his word. And in the context of our text, it brings to you and me the mercy and salvation of God. David Mathis, uh, who is uh, the executive director for DesiringGod.com, writing about the mercy of God, said this, quote, The mercy of God is one of the most precious realities in the world, one of the most revealing themes in all the Bible, and one of the most tragically misunderstood truths about God. And Mathis, reflecting on this great truth about the mercy of God, points to the Word of God that it reveals his heart, his merciful heart. We go to... uh, the time of Moses and the Exodus. And the Lord said this about himself to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You find that in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Here's God describing himself as merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Well, moments ago, we began with a fiction story. It was a story of a man who betrayed his employer. And in that story, the employer was very powerful and to be feared. And despite this potential ramification, this man ran, ran far. And even in the midst, even in the midst of the storm that he found himself and the disaster around him, He refused to acknowledge his role. That is until it was certain 
that none would survive the wrath. The wrath unleashed because of his betrayal. Now, that's just a story. It's a story that I made up for a number of reasons. But let's go from fact, from fiction, sorry, from fiction to fact. Going to fact now, pay attention. And let's go to the minor prophets, to the prophet Jonah. You know, Jonah, I know maybe many of you know the story. Maybe you grew up understanding the story and sang some songs about it in uh, children's church. But we know that Jonah, as some have so called him, was the reluctant prophet. And short and skinny is this. God commanded Jonah, as his prophet, to go to a city called Nineveh. Why did he do that? Well, the scriptures tell us in Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, and this is God's own words, for their evil head has come up before me. So here's the scoop on Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. It was known for its cruelty. You want to know how cruel Nineveh was? Go to another prophet called Nahum and read chapter 3 for yourself. And Nineveh was the historical enemy of Israel and Judah. So what was Jonah's response to his command to go to Nineveh? The text tells us Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He ran away. Jonah 1, 3. He packed his bags and he did a runner. Why did you do that? Well, I can only speculate in one way. And this is all what I'm going to say is a speculation, this particular part. Maybe it was pride. But maybe, and more probable, it could have been Jonah's sense of spiritual superiority. After all, the Assyrians were a pagan nation. Read Nahum chapter 3. They were cruel, they were brutal. And they were the enemy of Israel. And Jonah was a true Israelite. He was a recipient of God's covenant blessing. He was a prophet of God. But you know what's interesting to note? Even as Jonah, in his time, was going through this moment here that we're reading about or understanding about, Israel itself had a long track record by this time of refusing to hear the prophets of God that God had sent to them so that they would repent from their own sin and idolatry. Interesting. Very interesting. So spiritual superiority led Jonah, Jonah to do a runner. You see, folks, God is sovereign over creation. That's what the Bible teaches us. And the affairs of man. He's sovereign over the affairs of man, and he would not be reluctant. And we know that in a story, Jonah ended up in the belly of a fish, and I can only imagine how that must have been. And in that belly, Jonah prayed. And then we read that the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out upon dry land. Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. You know, conveniently, two or three days from Nineveh. Well, Jonah, the reluctant prophet, eventually went to Nineveh as commanded, and he said to the Ninevites, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah, chapter 3, verse 4. And wouldn't you believe it? The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Jonah, chapter 3, verse 5. Nina, 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 pardon me, folks. Nineveh believed God and repented. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. So the question is, how did Jonah respond? Do you know that? Do you know that story? But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Jonah became angry. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. Jonah was so upset that he prayed that God would take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah chapter 4, verse 3. And God responded, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know what their right hand from their left hand who do know Jonah 4.11. 
who do not know their right hand from their left hand. Pardon me. I had a little mental block there. My friends, the story's not about Jonah. This is a story about the mercy of God. So we go back to our text. The psalmist made his plea to God. Let your mercies come. You see, folks, the, the psalmist knew he needed the mercies from, he needed mercy from God. We all need the mercy of God. The Apostle Paul experienced, and just read about his experience in Acts chapter 8 and following. The Apostle Paul experienced and marveled at the mercy of God in his own life and ministry. And in his letter to the Roman church, chapter 9, 15, he quoted from Moses the words of God. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God is the one who decides where he will place his mercy because it is his very heart. Have you ever considered the mercy of God, my friends, in your own life? Have you ever considered it? Or do you take it for granted? Or maybe without even realizing it, we walk around with a sense of spiritual superiority. You know, we play that comparison game. I'm not like that person. I wouldn't do that. We don't say it out loud, of course, but inside we lift up our spiritual noses high up in the air and we look down at the Ninevites around us. We're forgetting that God is holy and just, that he's all-powerful beyond even our capacity to ever understand. And he does show his righteous anger on those who uh, walk all over his glory. And yet God desires mercy. James in chapter 2 verse 13 reminds us of this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. My friends, God is a merciful God. And we need a merciful God. I just want to sort of press pause for a moment. And if you've been paying attention, and I know you have, you might be saying, why have we spent the majority of our time up so, time so far unpacking half of verse 41? You see, there are eight verses in the stanza here, which means we have 7.5 verses to go. Well, I don't think we'll be, we're going to be able to go through 7.5 more verses unless we want to stay for hours, or at least another hour or so. Well, in my preparation for this message, I uh, found it somewhat perplexing, somewhat troublesome, somewhat puzzling when I got to this place as I was fleshing out all my notes and things that I had been preparing with. And it was so perplexing that I had to ask the question, what now, Lord? What, what do we, what, where do we go from here? How do we close this off with the wonderful truth that we've realized here in the Word of God? Yes, you are indeed merciful for, to us each and every day. And that certainly must be more than enough to give us hope for the day. You know, the answer did show itself to me. And it wasn't some voice that from heaven or God did not speak to me in, a, in an audible voice in my office. Tony, look at verse 41 again. The word of God pointed me and points us today to the second half of verse 41. We'll call it 41b. Let's read that together. Your salvation according to your promise. This is the path. This is the way forward for you and me. The psalmist in his own way, when he said here at verse 48, I will lift my hands to your commands, which I love, gives us an important clue. For in, the pra for in his praise of God, he had surrendered completely to God's word. Not only do we need the mercy of God, we need salvation also. For this is the way for you and me today. Just like the psalmist, to praise God and surrender our whole lives to a merciful God who has provided salvation according to his promise. The Apostle Paul put it in this way uh, in his Roman letter, to the uh, Roman letter, which is my probably favorite verse in Romans. 
Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Can I ask you, do you believe the gospel, the good news of Christ? The Apostle Paul went on to say in that very next verse, The righteous shall live by faith. Whose righteousness is he talking about? Well, we know that the psalmist had put his faith in the righteousness of God. Verse 40. Not in his self-righteousness, but in the righteousness of God. Have you put your faith in God? You know, when you think about where we are today in this world, in our culture here in the West, how highly we think of ourselves. I mentioned it last week that we, we love the selfies, we like the self-promotion, we love people to pat us on the back. But consider what we bring to God. Do you know that we only bring one thing to God? And only one thing that we have to bring to God is our sin. Is our sin. We have nothing else to offer him. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Ephesian church, we were dead in the trespasses and sins, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. This is all we have to offer. But what does God offer us? Well, in the same letter, the very same letter we come into this verse where Paul said, but God. These are amazing two words in this whole letter. But God being rich in mercy. We've been talking about the mercy of God. But God being rich in mercy, Ephesians 2 verse 4. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Friends, God is a merciful God. And we need a merciful God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your great mercy. The mercy that is at the foot of the cross for each and every person. Sin of the world. Paid for. Once for all, O oh Lord, for those who have not known your mercy, grant them your mercy. Grant them your repentance unto salvation. Thank you. O oh Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day. Shalom.